Tennessee scrimmages for the second time this spring practice here this morning on a Thursday morning. What are the five things that I'm looking for that I want to hear back from whenever Tennessee wraps up its second scrimmage? That's a whole lot more here on your Thursday. Locked on balls. You are locked on balls. Your daily podcast on the Tennessee volunteers. Part of the locked on podcast network, your team every day. What is up, everybody? Welcome into it. This is your Thursday edition of Locked on Vols. I'm your host, Eric Kane, at underscore Kane on Twitter, at Locked on Vols, where you can always find me. As always, you can find me wherever you find your podcast and making me uh, Locked on Vols your first listen. Do appreciate that. Please subscribe to Locked on Vols on the YouTube channel, the Push to 7K. It's very much real. Still got a little work to do, so uh, I'd appreciate you guys if you could subscribe to the Locked on Vols YouTube channel. Okay, so... Uh, what's on the docket here today? Well, Tennessee scrimmages for the second time this spring practice uh, coming up later this morning, Thursday morning. What do we want to hear? What do I want to hear from Josh Hypo when he meets with the media after the practice session? What are the players and position groups, top five things I'm going to be on the lookout for to see if Tennessee can do here in scrimmage number two? And then don't look now, but the orange and white game it is a week from Saturday. It is coming up in just a little over a week. Spring practice has come and gone in an absolute hurry. And so scrimmage number two, it is a, a big one. And we're going to talk about that, preview that here in segment number one. In segment number two, Kirby Smart had some comments the other day uh, when asked about what he's looking for at the quarterback position. So was he talking about Tennessee? I want to play those comments. We're going to discuss and try to figure it out together because I think he definitely was talking about Tennessee. And if he was talking about Tennessee... I mean, you know, does he have a right to? Like, well, what's what's this mean? Let's look into it, right? We're at that point in the offseason. That's in segment number two. And then in segment number three, Archie Manning, he went on Sports Center a couple days ago and had a lot of good things to say about Hendon Hooker, Tennessee quarterback. What were those things? All that and more coming up here on your Thursday Locked on Vols. Okay, so top five things I'm looking for Tennessee to do to accomplish here in spring scrimmage number two. Spring scrimmage number two set to get going at about... 10 a.m. ish, 10 a.m. ish here on a Thursday morning. And then Josh Hobble is going to meet with us shortly thereafter. And I look forward to seeing what he has to say about the performances for Tennessee. Uh, let's go in reverse order here. Number five, I'm looking at some of these young guns, right? I'm going to name a couple of different players here. Um, but this is all kind of in encompassing number five. What does Arian Carter look like? You continue to hear nothing but great things about the linebacker Arian Carter and how he's come in and he looks good, and he's playing well, and he's making plays, and he's picking up the defense, and the, the game is slowing down for him. How does he look in scrimmage number two for Tennessee? What about Ricky Gibson? You know, Jordan Matthews was the highest, you know, guy, guy talked about in terms of the cornerback coming in this past recruiting class, and, and Ricky Gibson kind of flew under the radar a little bit, but Ricky Gibson is having a really, really good spring practice, and when William Martinez met with the media on Wednesday, he pretty much said, hey, there are no starters. There are no ones. There are no twos. There are no threes. We're all rotating right now. This is their platform to show us what they got. And then we'll start putting them into the ones and the twos and the threes at some point. But right now there's no, there's, there, there's no structure. Um, I'll believe that when I see it, to be completely honest. But nonetheless, Ricky Gibson is out there, and he's making plays this spring. So what does he look like in spring, spring scrimmage number two? What about Deshaun Bishop? He might be the hottest name of all the young guys here so far in spring practice, and he's just kind of taking opportunities that are given to him right now, right? Jabari Small is not practicing. Jalen Wright is not getting a whole lot of work, right, because um, he's a veteran and he's had injury issues himself. You got Dylan Sampson that's looking really, really good, but Deshaun Bishop's getting a whole lot of run with Cam Selden um, you know, practicing with a red non-contact jersey. You got to believe that the, the contact for him is pretty limited. What does Deshaun Bishop look like with the second group, mixing in and out with the second group? Because in the first scrimmage, the, the talk was that he looked really good. And you've heard his name being mentioned a couple of different times by a couple of different players when they met with the media saying, man, he runs hard. He finishes well. That's good to hear. Of course, Deshaun Bishop is um, a local product here from Corns High School. So you want to hear that. And that's really, really good to see. But um, those are some of the young guys, of course, that I'm looking forward to hearing about here and of course Nico you want to you want to know how Nico Imaliava does um, as he continues to pick up the offense and the cadence and all that type of stuff 
you know, going on throughout uh, his first spring uh, here at Tennessee. So those are some of the young guns, the names from the younger guys I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing. What about number four? Will the tight ends continue to be active in the receiving game? You know, Ethan Davis is a guy that has looked really, really good, but is, you know, wearing a red non-contact jersey, coming off an injury. I don't think he's um, 100% full go ready to go right now, and that's okay. But in scrimmage number one, Jacob Warren caught a touchdown pass. McAllen Castles caught a touchdown pass. Where is McAllen Castles in terms of the physicality of the game that, that you know, tight ends have to do in order to make this offense go? Uh, very much a pass catcher, you know, when he was recorded, recruited to Cal to begin his, uh, you know, college career. And, of course, whenever he was I'm at UC Davis, you know, how is he continuing to progress here with Tennessee? But those two guys being options in the passing game, they very much were in scrimmage number one. Will that continue in scrimmage number two? We'll have to find out. I'll be looking to hear an awful lot about Tennessee's tight end situation. Uh, number three the secondary and you know I, I just kind of said what Willie Martinez said when he met with the media on Wednesday he's saying hey we're all rotating they're all getting opportunities there are no ones there are no twos there are no threes and I mean that's good to hear sure but in order to change what has been the same secondary for year after year who's going to step up step up and make plays uh Danico Slaughter met with the media on Wednesday and he said hey we just you know when we get, went back and we reviewed the season and everything we just came to realization like, hey, we got to make more plays. When the ball's in the air, we got to go get it. We have got to be a guy that we've got to be a team that is ball hawking and trying to go and get uh, the football out of the air. And so can there be some turnovers? The quarterbacks did a really good job. No turnovers with Joe Milton and with Nico Iamaliava in scrimmage number one. Of course, you don't want to hear that. they that, that's It's always a double, double-edged sword, right? It's like, it's like, oh, well, the defense really, really won the scrimmage. Well, that's great on the defense, but huh, how about the offense look? Man, that's not great. Or the rush defense was so, so good. Well, oh, that offensive line, did they not block anybody? That's center squad scrimmages, right? But I'm looking for the secondary. Can you go and you make some plays, turn over the football, and create some big-time plays for uh, that defense that I think is going to take a big step, and I think it's going to be pretty good in 2023. But the pass defense has got to get a whole lot better. The secondary, who's where? And who's making plays? Number two, wide receivers. And this is kind of go on the the, the same path I'm getting at to to, sec, to uh, the, the number one thing that I'm looking for, and I'll get to that in a moment. But number two the thing that I'm looking for and looking forward to hearing about is wide receivers. Um, Bru McCoy's not doing anything in spring, okay? You've got Ramel Keaton, who's a bit banged up right now. You got Squirrel White, who has been in shells earlier in the week and was in a red non-contact jersey on Wednesday. You know, who's stepping up? You know, the, Dante Thornton is a guy that's been nursing a, short, a sore hamstring. There is a lot of young receivers getting a whole lot of run right now. You know, for Tennessee, guys like Chaz Nimrod, guys like Caleb Webb. Um, you know, who's stepping up? Who's making some plays at wide receiver for Tennessee? And that, that's kind of what I want to hear if anybody, you know, take, goes the extra mile and, and, and comes down with a big time play in scrimmage number two, because practice is great and practice how you earn playing time. But there's also something said to, that can be said for going out and doing it in a game like setting. So, you know, we'll see um, if, if who's going to be out there making plays at wide receiver. We'll see if Keaton gives it a go, if Thornton gives it a go, if Squirrel gives it a go. Um, you know, Tennessee is going to be more cautious than not, no matter what. Uh, during the spring season, that's for sure. And number one, the number one thing I'm looking forward to hearing about is the performance of the offensive line. You're replacing Darnell Wright. You're replacing Jerome Carvin. Cooper Mays has not practiced full go in over a week. Cooper Mays did not play in scrimmage number one, and I'm willing to bet he will not play in scrimmage number two. Ollie Lane got dinged up a little bit towards the end of uh, practice on Monday as well. You <laughs> know, what in the world does this offensive line look like? You're going to have John Campbell at one tackle, and then you know the three guys trying to figure it out the other tackle, being Gerald Mincy, J.J. Crawford, and Dane Davis. You will likely have Parker Ball at center, or maybe Addison Nichols at center. You'll have Javante Spragans at one guard, and then you know if Ollie Lane doesn't play tomorrow, you'll probably you know obviously Andre Curick, who is very much battling Ollie Lane for that starting guard position, and then Jackson Lampley. It's a very different looking offensive line and the question's been asked a couple times this week when do you start to worry about the offensive line well in spring practice it's definitely not the time to worry because they're trying to figure it out and the fact that you're getting guys not named Cooper Mays to snap the football the fact that you're getting guys 
uh, to get in there and get a whole lot of looks at playing right tackle and left guard. That's a good thing in spring practice. They will need to come together and figure it out, and that will be in fall camp. But also, you want to be able to you know block and be able to move the ball offensively to put together some competitive scoring drives, right? And you know the offensive line is very, very much in flux right now in terms of who's out there and who's not. So that is the number one thing I am looking forward to hearing back about scrimmage number two. So what about you? My five things. Want to hear about the young guns? Some of those freshmen want to hear about the tight ends that they're still in back, still active in the uh, the passing game. I want to hear about the secondary, any big plays there. I want to hear about the wide receivers, who's out there, and who made some impressive catches. And then I want to hear about the offensive line, who started the scrimmage and who maybe stood out, who maybe gained some separation and trying to fill uh, those two gaps. All right. Uh, we will obviously come back tomorrow, and I'll tell you everything that I've heard about spring scrimmage number two during Tennessee's spring practice. Hey, when we come back, Kirby Smart had some things to say about what he looks for in a quarterback. Was it throwing shade at the University of Tennessee? That and more when Locked On Balls returns. But hey, the NBA playoffs are almost here, and now it's the perfect time to download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's America's number one sportsbook because new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It is safe, it is secure, and it is super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores, even three-pointers drained. You can then you can bet on the spread, the money line, the total, hit that over, hit that under. You can go individual player props like points, rebounds, assists, turnovers, all that and more. That's it. FanDuel Sportsbook. Plus, FanDuel Sportsbook even lets you combine your bets for a chance at bigger payouts with same game parlay. Don't miss the chance to get your no sweat first bet up to one thousand dollars in bonus bets. Uh, when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That is FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. All right, guys, welcome back into your Thursday edition of Locked on Vols. This is Eric Kane, and here in this segment, we're going to talk about uh, some comments that Kirby Smart had uh, earlier this week. Um, I believe this is a press conference setting. Uh, and, and then the question was just simply asked, hey, what do you think, you know, what are you looking for in a quarterback, right? You know, what are you looking for in quarterbacks who play in your system? And, and his answer was was pretty unique because it sounds like a deliberate, a deliberate shot at the University of Tennessee. So we're going to listen to it. You're on YouTube. You're going to watch, uh, you're going to watch a little uh, a version of it. And tell me what you think. Is Kirby Smart dissing the University of Tennessee? Demeanor and communication. So, like, I can I can get the stats, but it, it's like a true quarterback is a decision maker. In our system, because some systems take all the pressure off the quarterback and they just go really fast, we don't do that. We're a quarterback-driven offense. So can you process the information? That means get the signal, get people lined up, then see what the defense is in, and figure out, are we in the right situation? Which of these three choices Coach Bobo's given me am I going to utilize on this play? And then the play happens, and there might be a mistake or a breakdown, and you not go full metal jacket and have catastrophe mode and put us in a bad situation. So, you know, decision-making is the number one thing I want to see at the quarterback position. Can you make consecutive decisions over and over that don't cost our team games? Because we have enough playmakers and we have enough plays that you will make a play – Inevitably, don't make a bonehead play. And that's what we're trying to avoid. All right, so that was Kirby Smart when, an when answering the questions on you know what he looks for in a quarterback. A couple of things here. Uh, first and foremost, hope you did pick up on, he said, um, it was the very, it was towards the beginning of that clip, you know, we're not a quarterback-friendly system. Um, we don't just go fast and make it easier on the quarterback. I mean, that's, that's pretty direct that he's talking about Tennessee. I mean, Tennessee is one of the fastest, you know, tempo teams uh, in the country. And there's been this long and uh, there's, there's been this, you know, fair or not. I mean, there's been this, you know, uh, idea that Tennessee's system favors the quarterbacks. And Tennessee's system is why Jalen Hyatt is who Jalen Hyatt is. I mean, sure, you know, there were, there were some plays schemed up to go, you know, go for six for Jalen Hyatt's. But also, Jalen Hyatt had to win one-on-one -on -one battles against Alabama and against Georgia. And Jalen Hyatt against Alabama did that five times. 
Um, and, you know, against some of the other teams in the SEC. Did it twice against LSU and, you know, some other time, you know, big time catches. But, I mean, that was that was deliberate, right? And it, sure, you this can be, and I'm, I'm sure the Georgia fans are going to jump in the comment section because anytime I say anything about Georgia, I have to continue to go through and monitor uh, these comments on YouTube. It's really just hilarious. But, um, and, and sure, this can be, you know, Tennessee, you know, living rent free and all this type of stuff. But, I mean, you heard the comments there. It was, you know, quarterback friendly system like some other teams out here, just going fast and all that type of stuff. That that is deliberate to Tennessee. Also, he continued to go on and say, you know, in our system, our quarterback has to process information at a really, really, you know, fast pace. You have to decipher which one of the three play calls you get and decipher which one you're going to call, depending on what the defense is in. Hey, newsflash. To Kirby, there's a lot of teams, Tennessee included, that does that same thing, that asks that same thing from its starting quarterback. This is not unique to what Bobo does at Georgia, okay? That is not unique to what the University of Georgia does. There are several, several quarterbacks. In fact, if you're a quarterback at the Power 5 level and you can't do that then I don't think you're in a very good position as a team overall, in my opinion. Hinton Hooker did that repeatedly for Tennessee. If you watch games, there are three guys signaling in you know, information and everything. And sure, one of those might be dead. Two of those guys might be dead and one might be live, depending on the, the color, You know, and they change it quarter to quarter and all that. But still, you are getting a call, and Hinton Hooker had absolute free reign at the line of scrimmage to check out of anything he wanted to, flip the script, go pass to run, whatever the case may be. This is not something unique just to Georgia. That's what cracks me up about this whole thing. Sure, I listened to the quote, and I dug down deep into it a little bit because it was a, it was a clear shot at Tennessee. It just, it just was what it was. But what, what made me stay, I came for that dig at Tennessee. What made me stay was Kirby Smart trying to make it out like he's got smart quarterbacks and nobody else does. Are you kidding me? To be a quarterback in the Power Five in the Southeastern Conference and your quarterback can't decipher which play to run based on which defense alignment that they line up in? Again, if you have a quarterback that can't do that and you're a Power Five program, you are not a very good Power Five program. Hate to break it to you there. So anyway, that that's a couple of things. But, you know, Kirby can say whatever he wants to, right? Kirby and Georgia are back-to-back -back national championships. I mean, that's what Tennessee wants to be. That's what every college football program in America wants to be. You want to be a national champion. And, and Kirby's won back-to-back. -back. And so you got to get tip your cap, right? I mean, it is what it is. So Kirby Smart can say whatever he wants to. They're the champs. But also, you know, I don't think... Georgia and Georgia fans are lying awake at night having nightmares about the University of Tennessee, right? Tennessee had its best team in you know over a decade last year, and it still wasn't a competitive football game. The final score was just a two it was a 14 point loss. I understand that. Uh, but I mean, if you remember watching that game, it was not it was not the most competitive football game. It felt like Tennessee was down by a whole lot more. That does not mean that Tennessee's not good, and that does not mean that Tennessee's not on the verge of knocking off the top-ranked team in the country or Georgia or whatever the case may be because Tennessee's had wins like that in 2022. That That's that's for sure. But also, I mean, Georgia's very much aware of Tennessee, right? Georgia knows that Tennessee is out there. Georgia knows that Tennessee is getting better. Georgia recognizes the play that Tennessee has done here in recent memory to s severely close that gap, if you will. So... It's not like you're worried about it, but you acknowledge it and you know that you know that dominance over the SEC East is not what it once used to be, even though you just won a national championship. Florida is down right now. South Carolina is you they're they're in a pretty decent spot right now, especially if you get court, good quarterback play from Spencer Rattler again. But Tennessee is clearly the challenger to Georgia in the SEC East right now. So I don't know. I just found it kind of weird that you would take a, a an unnecessary shot because it, it is what it is. I mean, somebody said, hey, Kirby, was that a shot at Tennessee? He's going to say, oh, no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. I've got the utmost respect for Josh Heupel and the Tennessee program. They do things. Blah, blah, blah. You're never going to admit it on the record, but 100% that was a shot at the University of Tennessee for sure. But also, who cares? Kirby, at the end of the day, is your goal, is your is your aspirations as a college football coach not to 
win national championships. In order to win national championships, you've got to win football games. So even if all that stuff that you said was true, Tennessee is winning football games. So who cares if it's an easy system, if it's a quarterback friendly system and Tennessee goes fast, if you're winning football games, then who flipping cares? Right? Right. So again, it's just, it's, it's, it's hypocritical on a number of levels, you know, that, that dig at Tennessee right there, because again, if you don't think that's a dig at Tennessee, then, well, I can't help you out much right there. Uh, it just kind of is what it is. So I don't know. A lot of you guys asked me to kind of comment on that. So I went and I heard about it, but I went and listened to it and I kind of dig some, did some digging and, and that's kind of my thoughts on, on what that is. Um, it's just kind of funny in my opinion, to be completely honest. Um, also, you know, I'm not going to act like Georgia was the biggest challenger to Tennessee to get Jake Merkling or Tennessee beat out North Carolina to get Jake Merkling or who was a four star quarterback who was a top 100 prospect in the country um, from Savannah, Georgia. Georgia offered, um, I believe, I believe Jake Merklinger was a take at Georgia, uh, but Georgia was third in that in that list, right? But, but again, you you have those. You have those comments right after Tennessee, a week after it gets sent, or days really after Tennessee gets a commit from a four star quarterback in your state. Also, you're saying these comments when Hendon Hooker is shooting up the draft boards. We'll talk more Hendon Hooker here in just a moment on what Archie Manning had to say about him. But I mean, Hendon Hooker was just mocked in the first round. So again, it's hypocritical on so many different levels. So it, it's not it's not a big thing. It's not the end of the world. But you know, you hear those comments, and it's hard not to hear that dig at the University of Tennessee because that's what it was. Um, so I, I just think that it kind of goes to show you that I don't think Georgia's scared, but Georgia knows. Georgia is aware. The head football coach at Georgia is absolutely aware of kind of what's going on right now at the University of Tennessee. So um, I kind of found that uh, interesting. You guys want to know my opinions on Kirby Smart's comments? Well, there they are. Uh, what did Arch Manning, Archie Manning have to say about Hendon Hooker he had an appearance on Sports Center a couple of days ago. A lot of good stuff to say about Tennessee's quarterback and the guy that's about to be drafted into the National Football League. More on that coming up next here on Locked On Balls. All right, guys, we got a final segment left here of this Thursday edition of Locked On Balls. Appreciate you guys hanging out with me here today, making Locked On Balls your first listen. Tennessee scrimmage number two of spring practice. That is later this morning. Josh Hopple's going to be with the media. Look forward to breaking down everything that I have heard. About scrimmage number two with you guys here on Locked On Vols here for a Friday. Also, Tennessee baseball gearing up for a big time series against number three, Florida. That's coming up Thursday, Friday, and Saturday of this weekend. Another Thursday, Friday, Saturday uh, series. So a lot of exciting things happening there. Tennessee football recruiting. It never stops. But hey, um, Archie Manning, he made an appearance on Sports SportsCenter um, earlier this week. And um, he's promoting his new ESPN plus special on the clock, which features conversations with all the Mannings, Peyton, Eli, I would imagine Cooper as well, along with Archie are having with some of the top quarterback prospects in the 2023 uh, class. So, you know, appearing on sports center, uh, Archie Manning was asked about Hendon hooker and he had a lot of good, good things to say about Hendon hooker. He said, well, he transferred from Virginia tech rest assured. We're always going to have the Tennessee quarterback at our camp. You can just bet on that if you know what I mean. Obviously, Peyton Manning, you know, is, is going to always have the Tennessee quarterback at their uh, their passing academy camps. But he goes on to say, but I think what impressed me about Hendon, the day before when he was working out in Knoxville, he got hit in the mouth. I'm not sure if he was with a football, probably was, but knocked a tooth out. And the trainer said, don't go. You don't need to go down there. You really don't need to work for the next three or four days. Um, it's nothing bad, but he came anyway, and he only threw a little bit, uh, but he just came to be around the guys. He came to be around Peyton and Eli. He came to kind of learn some things in their meetings, just outstanding human being. And so, you know, we had heard about Hendon Hooker's toughness. Of course, we've seen it the last two years here at Tennessee, right? But also, correct me if I'm wrong, there was media, there was media availabilities. Maybe it was the week of the Alabama game um, this past football season. Maybe it was spring practice. Something about asking some offensive linemen. I think it might have been Cooper Mays that actually said this, but you had Hendon Hooker in the 2021 game at Alabama 
lose a few teeth. You know, got hit in the got hit in the face, got got hit pretty hard, lost a couple teeth, but he stayed in the football game and kept competing. And he had a heck of a ball game. Gave Alabama everything they could possibly handle on its home field in 2021. If you remember, Nick Saban was beside himself, losing his mind on the sideline. Um, of course, Tennessee still lost that football game in a hurry at the, in the end. It kind of went away there. But um, we had heard about Hinton Hooker's toughness before, obviously. And we've seen it. But here's another example that Archie Manning is saying that he was working out, got hit in the face, lost some teeth or whatever, was advised not to go to the passing academy, yet still went because he wanted uh, to be around the guys and wanted to be a student of the game and learn. Quote, just an outstanding human being, end quote. Uh, he went ahead and... I talked about his season this past year and obviously the ACL injury. Uh, quote, we followed him close throughout the year. What a year he had. What a year he was having. He had the unfortunate injury. That was just uh, that was just not right because I'm sure, I, I'm not sure if he was going to win the Heisman Trophy or not, but they were doing some great things. Uh, but he's handled it so well, talking about the injury. I check in with him often. He's got a great positive attitude. I think Hendon Hooker is going to make some NFL team a really really good quarterback one day. Some high praise there from Archie Manning on SportsCenter. Again, on the ESPN flagship show to promote the new ESPN Plus on the clock for the Manning family. On there promoting it, but ask about Hendon Hooker a lot, who's you know the fifth quarterback essentially on the, on the quarterback hot board for this class, but very easily could be a first-round draft pick. Um, and, and that's kind of where it's trending right now. Some really, really good things said by Archie Manning on Hinton Hooker. Does that even really surprise us, though? I don't think it should because, obviously, you know, we, we, we've seen it in action the last couple of years. Um, Hinton Hooker, of course, is recovering from an ACL injury, and uh, he spoke to the media. Um, I was there. Uh, <laughs> I was there. I saw it happen. Um, he spoke to the media last week after Pro Day and was asked about his status in terms of the injury. Uh, he said that um, he feels like he's making a, a whole lot of progress in terms of his ACL tear. He said the next checkpoint is going to be in a week and a half, and he's going to see if he's going to be able to drop back. But he said it's been good to actually take a, a little bit of a drop, feeling good, coming out here, throwing with the guys, being around the guys. It's been an absolute blast. So Hendon Hooker's recovering at a really, really good rate right now, and he, it was good to see him with the football in his hands You know, last week at Pro Day because it had been so long since we've seen that. But Hendon Hooker continues to be trending in the right direction. Tennessee very easily could have two first-round draft picks, potentially, you know, might have three first-round draft picks, depending on the run with quarterbacks. Um, and, and if a quarterback needed team gets desperate to make a move to go get Hendon Hooker, potentially, I see that happening so much. Maybe if Minnesota passes on him at 23, what does Seattle do with all their, you know, draft capital? Um, you know, teams like Tennessee could maybe trade back up in, you know, I, I just, I see so many different scenarios of when Hendon Hooker is taken in the first round because all those other quarterbacks are going to be taken before him. Levis has dropped some, but, uh, you know, most mocks have the Bucks taking him at 14, trading up with Houston. I believe it's Houston to take Will Levis uh, at 14, but a team's going to be desperate out there thinking that, you know, Hendon can be the one just like we see every single year. And, Boy, what a joy would it be if they draft up and get Hendon Hooker in the first round. What a joy would it be if Jalen Hyatt is selected at the end of the first round. Of course, we know that Darnell Wright is going to be selected in the first round. So I thought that was really neat stuff there from Archie Manning. I wanted to bring it on the podcast. I know you guys would uh, you know, par- pretty much enjoy hearing that. A lot of praise for Tennessee's Hendon Hooker heading towards the NFL draft. Hey, coming up on tomorrow's Locked on Vols, everything that happened with Tennessee's scrimmage number two. We're going to highlight it all right here. On Locked On Vols, make Locked On SEC your second listen right here on Locked On, uh, right here when you're listening on your uh, listening device. Listen to Locked On Vols, then go and make Locked On SEC your second listen. Chris Gordy does a fantastic job taking you around the SEC in 30 minutes or less. Great interviews as always. Make Locked On SEC your second listen right behind Locked On Vols. Guys, I appreciate you as always. Please subscribe to the channel on YouTube. Give me five stars and a positive review on Apple Podcasts. And uh, we'll try to get tomorrow. This is Locked On Vols.